Garner. This is Sarah Garner. I want to introduce y'all to Nicole Cofer, my friend from West Virginia. Nicole does the same job in West Virginia that I do in North Carolina. Her title is Traffic Safety Resource Prosecutor. Let me tell you a little bit about her background. Nicole has a Bachelor of Science with a focus on neuroscience, whatever that is, um, from the University of Pittsburgh. And then that wasn't enough education, so she went on to get her JD to become an attorney. She has her MBA, her Master of Business Administration, and her Master of Law, so she has an advanced law degree in forensic science. She worked as a West Virginia assistant AG and a, Nicole, I hope I say it right, Kanawha County assistant prosecutor as the DWI prosecutor. Nicole has also served as the chair of the Minority Lawyers of the West Virginia State Bar for more than a decade. On a personal note, I've known Nicole since she began as a TSRP. She is a fantastic resource to me, um, absolutely incredible at her job. And I think today's presentation will give you some insight on a topic that lots of us find uncomfortable to talk about, but we need to talk about because we are all subject to it. So at any rate, at this point, I will toss it off to my friend, Nicole Cover. Nicole, it's all you. Ooh, you did perfect. It is can all Cammy. so you did great. Um, if any of you watch, um, oh geez, it's the new show about Hannibal Lecter. Um, I can't think of the name of it right now. It's, it's escaping me, but the uh, young lady who plays the uh, younger officer, um, she's claiming to be from Kinwall County. And we're like, where is that? And she says, I'm from a small town in Kinwall County, West Virginia. And we're like, mm -mm. you just messed up a Southern accent and you just messed up how we pronounce our county. So that's unacceptable. Um, I appreciate Sarah's kind words. I hope, let me see, it's, I'm trying to see if I can share my screen with you. What we're going to be talking about is uh, implicit bias. I titled this presentation, uh, the implicit four letter word because this is a topic that makes most people uncomfortable. If you didn't notice by the picture or if you can see me, I am a brown uh, lady attorney who tends to get under the skin of a lot of people over my course of my career um, for a host of reasons. Um, some good, some earned, some not. Uh, but this topic is uncomfortable for you if you're part of the majority. It's uncomfortable uncomfortable for us who are part of the minority. And it's my hope today that we can talk about these things and kind of scratch the surface. This is a huge issue. Um, in reality, it's a huge issue and it makes us uncomfortable because it's a huge issue. So we're gonna start there. And I hope that you guys will, will stay with me, keep your minds open and, and, and that we can scratch the surface and make a difference in North Carolina and in all of our states um, and make it a little bit better. All right, I'm gonna start with a disclaimer. I'm gonna open up this talk with uh, something kind of like what you see with pharmaceutical commercials. Uh, you know the ones that I'm talking about. They're the ones that look a lot like this happy uh, middle-aged couple here. Uh, this seasoned couple is enjoying a beautiful time together. A lot of times these commercials may have someone outside exercising, enjoying the breeze, or possibly a couple on a romantic date in a field of flowers, and they run their fingers over the petals of these, I don't know, daisies. I'm, I'm choosing something. You've all seen it. We've all seen those commercials. The subjects that are in those commercials are always very happy. There's often very upbeat music playing in the background and then a voiceover pops up and it says something usually to the effect. Side effects here include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, heart palpitations, suicidal thoughts, sudden death, and anal leakage. Now of all of those, all of them are equally bad, but anal leakage, anal leakage to me always seems like the worst, but I digress there. In all sincerity and in all seriousness, I'm going to say some things during our talk today that may make you feel uncomfortable. And if we're being honest with ourselves, and if I'm being honest with you, it should make you feel uncomfortable. And there's nothing wrong with that. If I'm being honest with you, and I told Sarah this yesterday, I also talked with um, Eric Sweden uh, yesterday too, because I have been fretting over this particular presentation for you all for weeks on weeks on weeks. I told Sarah when we were talking before this and, and uh, the other uh, people who are facilitating this presentation that I was mean to my children because I had so much stress and anxiety over handling this issue with 
law enforcement. And by law enforcement, I mean officers, law enforcement, I mean prosecutors, law enforcement, I mean the whole entirety of the criminal justice system because this topic is so untouchable and so quickly for all of us to avoid because it's just, it just, yeah, just kind of gives you the EBGBs. So what I'm gonna ask of you today is that you stay present with me, that you take the information that I'm giving you and you ask yourself some critical questions about your own thoughts and your own behaviors and how those thoughts and behaviors may leak into how we administer justice. Whether you're an officer, whether you're a prosecutor, I don't know if, if judges sit in on these calls or not. We have, sometimes have that in West Virginia as a judge. We all have our role and we all have our individual biases. As a resource prosecutor in West Virginia, I am part of developing our curriculum for our prosecutors conferences and for our law enforcement tours. Every time we do it, of course, I'm the DUI girl, so we have to talk about DUI. Let's talk about drugs, let's talk about DUI. Because in my world, and probably only my world in West Virginia, those things are sexy. But the other thing that I think is equally important, and while albeit not sexy, um, is by definition of what we consider sexy, I always say we need to have something on implicit bias. And I am always met with, oh, this doesn't really apply to us. Man, we had, we had implicit bias training last conference. Uh, we don't have an issue with, with bias in pick a rural county, West Virginia. And if that person is you, if that's your gut response to this talk, then my challenge to you is to question your beliefs today because we all can do better, all of us. That includes me. So that's my disclaimer for you. I hope I didn't offend. If I did, apologies. It is not my intention to offend or, or put off anyone, although sometimes I do that. So, I think we are really still very compromised uh, by our history of racial inequality. I, I do think there's a presumption of dangerousness and guilt that gets assigned to black and brown people. It's the reason why uh, there are so many unarmed black men and boys who get shot and killed by the police. It's the reason why uh, there is this disconnect in communities of color. Uh, there's no trust, there's no legitimacy uh, with police departments. Um, but I think it's been created by this larger history, this legacy of racial inequality. Uh, I, I think that we've never really owned up uh, to the truth uh, behind our comfort level uh, with this ideology of white supremacy. And so you see it today manifest in many ways. Uh, a very small percentage of the lawyers in this country are black or brown. An even smaller percentage of the judges in this country are black or brown. A disproportionately high percentage of the people accused of crimes and arrested and sent to prison are black and brown. And you cannot ignore these racial features. Uh, we have counties in this state where no person of color served on a capital trial jury because they are excluded uh, in these discretionary strikes. Um, you know, I've been in a courtroom, I've you know, been practicing law for 30 years, I've been in a courtroom uh, getting ready to do a hearing with my suit on, sitting at defense counsel table uh, there early, and had a judge walk in, this is in the Midwest, I had a judge walk in and looked at me and he said, hey, 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 you get back out there in the hallway and you wait until your lawyer gets here. I don't want any defendant sitting in my courtroom without their lawyer. And I stood up and I said, oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Brian Stevenson. I am the lawyer. And the judge started laughing and the prosecutor started laughing. And I made myself laugh because I didn't want to disadvantage my client. The client came in, a young white kid I was representing. And we did the hearing. But afterward, I was thinking to myself, what is it that when this judge saw a middle-aged black man sitting in a suit and tie at defense counsel's table, it never occurred to him that that's the lawyer. And what that is, is this legacy, this narrative of racial difference that we have not confronted. Now, I can't see the makeup of everyone who's on this call with us today, um, but I'm sure that there is at least one person aside from myself that has had a similar interaction in a courtroom, either with another attorney, an opposing attorney, or from a judge. And that's a good question. Why is it that when you see someone of color sitting at council table, it is not immediately assumed that I'm an attorney versus I am a, a, a plaintiff or I am a defendant? 
why is it, why is it always drawn that way? And it's not always, so that's not a fair statement, but why, why is that a direction that we go? So who am I and why should you care about the conversation, um, what I have to contribute to you today? My short story is that I'm a biracial female, specifically I'm African-American and Ukrainian. I am a female attorney, and after transplanting from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to Southern West Virginia as a child, I grew up in, in the Southern coal fields of West Virginia. Um, as one might expect, I have experienced both racism and sexism as a child, as a teenager, and all the way up to adulthood today. I've experienced both those things so often that I've stopped counting. I've experienced them in the same way that Mr. Stevenson has suggested where a joke is made, a comment is made, we all laugh and we all kind of brush it under the, under the rug and then I just feel it later. There's someone else in this talk that's felt that before and understands where I'm coming from and where Mr. Stevenson is coming from. With that said, I'm also a human being, um, regardless of my color, regardless of my sex, um, who comes with my own implicit biases. And what I have tried to do in, in my practice, um, what I have tried to do in my life, what I have tried to do in raising my daughters is to work hard to acknowledge and dispel my own implicit biases because I have personal and professional goals. And those goals are for me to be a good person and a person who is fair and just in the execution of my duties as a prosecutor in the execution of my duties as a parent and as a mother, and in the execution of my duties as one of the cogs in our criminal justice system. This is why I'm telling you, this is an, an issue for everyone. This is a universal issue that hits each and every one of us. It does not matter if you are of color or not. It does not matter if you are male or female, old or young. These are topics that we all need to work on. So. Let's talk first about what this presentation is not. It is not a shot at or an attack on any specific arm of law enforcement. Um, what I plan to do and what I've said in the onset of this presentation is that we're just gonna scratch the surface so that we can recognize the things that we can do to do better. Um, it's not a secret that we live in a time of political and social unrest, and this is causing a lot of division across our nation. Um, and the criminal justice system, I think most of us would agree to some extent is rightfully the target of some of these attacks. Today's discussion isn't meant to point fingers at anyone, um, but rather to just scratch the surface so that we can get at the root of this problem, which, spoiler alert to those of you who are watching, predates the majority of us being alive. Um, truthfully, this topic needs to be across a series of lectures. Um, it is so in depth, it covers more issues than just race. It covers all sorts of different, different ways that we Im are implicitly biased against people based on gender, based on um, sexual orientation. Um, pick an issue and you can have implicit biases on it. There's no way, it's an exhaustive topic. Um, and it can be exhausting physically for all parties involved. I have sat amongst my colleagues who are of color and I have sat amongst my colleagues who are a part of the majority and we all share exhaustion. That exhaustion just comes from a different place. So if we can leave here today with the seeds of self-awareness sown to be able to recognize the intersection of our personal biases and our personal privileges and how those biases and privileges um, coupled with the, inherent, the inherent, excuse me, inherent power that we yield as part of the criminal justice system um, and the way that we administer criminal justice, then this won't be a lost hour that you spent with me. So again, keep your minds open and we will move on. I'm gonna start with the black emergency. Um, if you're a close friend of mine, so probably on this call, only Sarah uh, might've heard this story before, but as she said in her introduction for me, I spent uh, more than a decade as the minority, uh, as the chair of the minority lawyers for the state of West Virginia. As you can imagine, we are a huge body of black attorneys. Um, we're not. Uh, but last year, well, in the wake of George Floyd's death, um, many of you might have noticed, because I'm sure that your state did the same, that a lot of state bars were setting out um, statements for social justice, against discrimination, um, et cetera. And they were posting these, they were standing behind these things. Well, our state bar president at the time 
she decided I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put out a statement because everybody's doing it because, you know, it's always the right way, the right reason to do something. Everybody's doing it. I'm going to put it out. She drafts the statement, apparently circulates it around the board of governors for the bar, never sends it to me as the chair of the minority lawyers, but that's her prerogative. It's her administration. So our bar blast, which is our email that goes out to all of our bar members, um, it goes out every Tuesday. So Tuesday morning, Bar Blast goes out. The social justice statement is on the Bar Blast. It's a frontliner. It's a header. She's very proud of the statement. It's there. I'll be honest with you. She never asked me to read it. Up until that point, didn't read it. The Bar Blast is something that I look at and say, do I need any CLE hours, which I almost never do. Is there anything exciting going on around the state? Nope. Any vacancies I need to know about? Nope. And then I close it and go on with the rest of my day. Well, I look it over, do my same thing I do every Tuesday. Nothing that, that's earth shattering for me. Uh, close it, get myself ready, drop my girls at school, and then I head on to court because I had to be at court that morning. So as I'm driving to court, I get a phone call, and it's from our state bar president. And she goes, Nicole, we have a black emergency. And I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> pause. W what's a black emergency? And she goes, well, we have a problem with black lawyers. I was like, I'm just going to stop you right here. I love you. But I don't know that there's a such thing as a black emergency. And if there is, I'm pretty certain you're not, you're not going to be the person who gets to call it. And she laughed at me. I laughed. And she goes on to tell me what happens. So what happened is as a response to um, the social justice statement, which went out under her name as the bar state, as the bar president, um, there had been a response from a black lawyer in my jurisdiction here in Kanawha County. Um, and she said, this, this is just awful. It's scathing. It's miserable. I need you to read it. And I need you to give me your thoughts. And I said, all right, I have to go to court right now. When I get done with court today, I'll sit down with it. Did you email it to me? Oh my God. Yes. I already emailed it to you. All right. I'll give it a read when I'm done with my day. So I go on, go to court, handle my cases, um, run around with prosecutors that I enjoy. We laugh. We have a good day. We administer justice all day long because that's what we do. Um, I get home. For some reason, my children were not home. So I'm thinking they must have been with their father that evening um, because I remember the house being calm and still. My dogs were calm. Everybody's calm. And I was sitting on my couch and I said, oh, I got to read that thing. So I pull it up and I read it. Um, basically, what this black attorney is saying is this social justice, justice statement went out is disgusting. It's disgusting because um, it in no way addresses social justice. It in no way even acknowledges that there's discrimination in our social, in our criminal justice system or our, in, in the lack of social justice. And he goes on to explain um, what it's like when you walk into Kanawha County Courthouse. So as I'm reading it, nothing that he says is a lie. When I walk in, I, as a black prosecutor, walk in to our uh, courthouse, we are greeted. And if I'm a defendant or I'm just someone who has business of the day um, in the courthouse, I'm greeted by anywhere from four to six white male, either security guards or sheriff's deputies. Um, from there, magistrate court's on the bottom floor, um, and there is absolutely zero uh, support staff of color, court staff of color, magistrates of color. If I go upstairs, which is where our circuit courts are, there were no judges of color, no court staff of color upstairs. If I go downstairs to family law, there, was, there were no uh, staff of color, and I think there's one I don't know if it was at this time, she may have been off the bench by now, but there was one family law judge of color in the largest jurisdiction in the state of West Virginia. We are easily, criminal wise, the busiest docket in the state of West Virginia. And I'm sure the civil docket is about the same because we are the seat of government. We are where the magic happens in the state of West Virginia if there is such a place. Um, and so the story he's telling is not a story that's false. And he goes on to say, he, as a black defense attorney, and his clients who are black defendants, when they walk in, they immediately don't feel dis-ease because they feel like the system's not for them. Now, there's a whole lot of reasons why that is, and I don't think that the, that the general consensus is let's hold black people back, let's hold brown people back, but it's, a, it's, it's an experience that we don't think about. And so when I talked to her about what I read, she goes, did you read it? I said, yes, I did. And she goes, wasn't that the most offensive thing you've ever read? I said, it's a little more harshly written than I might have written it. I said, but nothing he said was untrue. And she goes, I don't understand. So I go on to explain the same thing. I said, this is my life. I said, I work in the largest jurisdiction in the state of West Virginia, and I am the black prosecutor. I said, we have one black public defender. 
And since I left Kanawha County to come to the Prosecuting Attorneys Institute, there are exactly zero black attorneys, black prosecutors, black support staff. Um, there is, and he works for the county, not for the prosecutor's office, one black janitor who's fantastic. He's a wonderful, wonderful person. He will make your day every time you see him. Um, but that is not, um, that is not something that is a good descriptor. See, I have a brain, my brain is farting and I apologize for that. Um, it's not a good descriptor for our community. It doesn't match our community. It doesn't look like our community. So as a black defendant, I'm walking in and I'm not feeling like I belong here. And that's one of the things that we have to think about in our hiring practices um, and, and in how we deal with people who don't look like us because they have a different perspective. I say us because I include myself in with prosecutors, even though I am a different type of prosecutor. Um, I've been told many times by black defendants, I'm just happy to see you here. It makes a difference. I know you're not on my team. I know you're not gonna help me, but it makes me feel like things will be fair. And what we wanna do is get to a point where it doesn't matter what my face looks like, what color my skin is, but everybody feels like I'm getting a fair shot when I walk into our respective courthouses. So how do we police racial bias? There are a couple things. One, don't reject the premise. Um, just because you are not personally affected in a negative way, or because this topic makes you uncomfortable, don't reject the premise that is there. There are communities of people who feel like they are minimalized, like they are marginalized, who feel like they are treated as lesser than in our criminal justice system, and that's a problem. Next, we have to understand the history of the distrust. There is a long history in our country, and our country is great. Our, I mean, please don't mistake anything that I say today as being, being a bash on the United States of America. We have so much excellence happening here, but we also have a long history of racial inequity that cannot be and should not be swept under the rug. I've had this conversation with officers that are friends of mine time and time again, and they'll say, I never owned any slaves. I didn't do this. And I'm like, I get it. But you have to realize what a short blip in history all of this was. It, it didn't happen 300 years ago. Sounds like a long time until we look at the, the massive history of the world. It's not that big of a time period. And it wasn't that far away. We're not that far removed from it. If we think of Jim Crow, we're less than 100 years from Jim Crow. And the civil rights movement, I can speak that my, my, both my parents, but my father specifically was alive and remembers um, what went on during that time period. So we can't just ignore that history. What we, should, what we need to do is understand the history of the distrust to help us not repeat that history again. We also have to accept that the numbers don't lie. There are multiple agencies across our nation that are, have been looking into this issue, including agencies within North Carolina um, that have taken a good hard look at traffic stops, at um, sentencing, at incarceration numbers, all of those things don't lie. They tell a story that doesn't necessarily seem reasonable and doesn't always seem like, it almost appears that we are, we are ignoring and just, just kind of letting things slide under and we don't, we don't need to do that. That's not the best way to make this uncomfortable conversation go away. What that is, is a very good way to perpetuate this discussion on and on and on. So the next time something huge happens, um, be it in a law enforcement arena, be it in a courtroom, the next time that something bad happens, we repeat the same cycle over and over again because we're not learning from history. We're not watching and paying attention. And finally, we have to realize that this is not in any ways just a police problem. It is not. Um, police are the ones that are on the forefront of it because everything that they do is recorded these days. And if it's not recorded because they have body cam and they have dash cam, it is recorded because someone has a cell phone. So we can catch people who are bad actors and there are bad actors out there, but bias makes it into our courtrooms every day. Bias is something that is real and it attacks all of our areas, not just law enforcement. So for us to, to ever accept that this is a law enforcement only issue, is again, us not wanting to actually address the problem. The problem is much larger than any one incident or series of incidents that may be found in law enforcement. So don't reject the premise. Um, what does this mean? This means that you will accept that my walk in life 
may look different than yours. That you will accept that things that happen to me, even if they don't make sense to you or my perception of things that happen to me, even though you may see it differently, does not mean it did not happen and does not mean that I did not experience it that way. I want every white person in this room who would be happy to be treated as this society in general treats our citizens, our black citizens. If you, as a white person, would be happy to receive the same treatment that our black citizens do in this society, please stand. You didn't understand the directions. If you white folks want to be treated the way blacks are in this society, stand. Nobody's standing here. That says very plainly that you know what's happening. You know you don't want it for you. I want to know why you're so willing to accept it or to allow it to happen for others. I love Jane Elliott. Um, Her fearlessness and her boldness to talk about an issue that makes people uncomfortable, knowing that she's of the same majority that feels uncomfortable is is very brave to me. I've enjoyed watching her different lectures over the years. but that particular clip, I, I find that really resonates with me. It's a, it's a discussion that I've had with my own mother who loves me more than anything. She has said time and time again, if anything ever happened to you, just lock me up and throw away the key because I'll be crazy. She loves me. She loves me. Um, but one thing, one conversation that my mother had with me when I was a young teenager and she's had with me since is that when she was pregnant with me in 1980, <laughs> she would cry and she'd say, what am I doing? And what am I bringing this little girl into? Am I bringing her into a society that will never accept her? Am I bringing her into a society that will treat her poorly because she's not gonna be like my mother is, white skin with blue eyes and blondish sandy browny hair. Mom was worried about that. And she was worried about it because she knew that that treatment existed. And that was treatment in Philadelphia, much less treatment in Southern West Virginia. So it's just things to think about. Think about if you were treated or someone you loved was treated the way that some of our um, communities are treated, would you be okay with that? Should we be okay with that? That's a question I would have you ask yourself. Next is, again, understanding the history of the distrust. It is no secret that our criminal justice system was created on the auspice of racism and segregation. And after having the distinct pleasure of working with men and women in all areas of this law enforcement system, I am comfortable and I agree with the fact that you all did not personally own any slaves and most of you are not personally racist. And so when you think about this topic, try your best not to take it as a personal attack on you and calling you racist. Because as I started out on the onset by telling you, I have my own implicit biases and sometimes Someone could think things that I think might be racist or might be sexist. And some of them could be because I am imperfect. I've been taught certain things. I'd like to think I'm very open-minded. I'd like to think that I am very fair because that's what I strive to be. But we all fall short sometimes. Um, I do also believe that, again, we all have personal biases. And I propose to you that the distrust in law enforcement and the criminal justice system is also biased. Sometimes it's implicit, sometimes it's explicit bias, but it's bias nonetheless. So it helps us to know where do we go from here when we know what the root of the cause is. And this is a place where history helps us. Now, before I go to advance to the next slide, I'm gonna go ahead and give you a kind of disclaimer of sorts that this, I can't remember the first or second video is an ACLU video. That offends you, I apologize. I don't subscribe to everything that they think, say and do, but sometimes they hit things right on the head. And he's going to give us, it's a trailer from a series of lectures that they did. They were only five to seven minute lectures, not very long, um, about different riots that have happened over the past 100 years. And it's important, not because we're bashing law enforcement, but it's important to go back if you have time and watch those videos. Because while they are in in the the way that we love the ACLU to be, very uh, um, heavy on, you know, reform and these different things, the one thing that they do have in these videos is they show that a riot that took place in 1919 
where the governor said, let's have a commission to figure out what this issue is and to figure out how we can not have this issue come up again, came to the exact same conclusions that our different um, agencies and our different um, commissions that come together to discuss these issues in 2020 and 2021 come up with. There's something to be said about that. This is why I'm sharing these videos with you. William Faulkner once said, the past is never dead, it's not even past. The trends we see today in police violence are the same trends we've seen over 100 years. Only now we have a choice. Do we root out the problem or do we keep papering over it? Be on the headline this morning and take a look at the history of the police force in America. The law enforcement system we have today wasn't shaped until the mid-1950s. Back in colonial times, there were no police officers. Communities would simply hire someone to act as night watch. It wasn't very effective. Most of the time, the watchman would sleep through his shift or get drunk. The first time we saw an organized law enforcement system was just before the Civil War. Cities set up what they called a slave patrol a group to prevent slave revolts and hunt down runaway slaves. After the war, these groups switched more to enforcing segregation. And as time went on, police forces focused mostly on protecting businesses in big cities from union organizers and crime rings. The problem? Police forces were controlled by local politicians. In 1929, President Hoover created the Wickersham Commission to look at how effective law enforcement was nationwide. The results of that commission led to the creation of independent police precincts that were separate from political parties and are more similar to what we have today. All right. Now, I said on the onset that the point of this presentation is not to bash law enforcement, and I maintain that. It is really hard to find videos um, and, and videos that aren't an hour and 20 minutes long that properly cover what that history looks like. And what we need to think about as a whole in the criminal justice system is that the fixes that don't address the root causes are not fixes at all. At this point, we have yet to properly address the long history of racial terror in our country. And if we're being honest to ourselves and looking back at our history, Blackness and brownness have been treated as a proxy or a substitute for criminality across the board, not just with law enforcement officers, but with prosecutors and with judges. We have such discourse and discomfort on this topic that we would prefer to rationalize it by pointing to one or a few rotten apples rather than looking inward at ourselves. Because in truth, we overlook our own complicity in creating an environment where black and brown lives are not treated equally. Our history can light our way out of the situation. And if we listen to what it tells us, then we, we know that we have to struggle through this moment. And all of us have to grow together in this moment. We have to confront the ways that our actions and our institutions can lead to the disparate treatment of people of color, even when it's done unintentionally. Um, we've had a lot of talk over the years on the war on drugs and, and, and how that disproportionately affected uh, African-American communities versus majority communities. And that's a real thing. Were law enforcement officers necessarily um, administering this, you know, being racist in administering the law? Absolutely not. They were administering the law that was on the books. That was the law of the day. And they were doing their job. But even when we do things that are legal and lawful, if that effect has unintentionally uh, treated to people of color or any other per uh, any other group of people desperately, then we as a community have to look at that. We have to look at that. We have to accept it. And we have to um, figure out how do we not do this again? How do we not repeat this history? William Faulkner once said, the past is never Be on the headline it's this not... morning. Sorry about that. Excuse me. Um, keep in mind that the protests that we see, um, the protests that we see are, are protests from people who want to be seen. They don't wanna be seen as threats. They wanna be seen as human beings. And the stories of failures that we've seen in our criminal justice system, failures from police, failures from prosecutors, failures from judges, are not a story about black and brown people. And I think if we can all understand and agree that this is a story about all of us, then we'll start to see change and we'll start to see progress. Um, this story is one of racial progress and there has been substantial progress. Um, 
I remember having a conversation with Sarah where she was concerned she may have said something that was off color and she wanted to know, was I out of line? And that sort of self-awareness is what we need to see because we all do it. We all do it. And the best of us will recognize, nope, I'm not perfect. I may have said something that was out of line. I may have done something that was out of line. I need to know, one, was it out of line? And two, even if it wasn't, if I have offended someone or if I have done something that oppresses another people or makes someone else feel oppressed, I need to address that. And you have to figure out what that is. But what this story is also about is the stubborn durability of American racism. It is about us making a concerted effort to not repeat the mistakes of our past, confront our own complicity, um, that this great American facade that somehow black and brown people are more threatened, more dangerous than others in our communities. So what we have to always remember and understand is that public safety and civil rights are not mutually exclusive goals. We can, we can have both of these things, but it's going to take us having self-reflection in our system. We run this system. We are the cogs that keep this system going. And for those of you who know defense attorneys, there are some excellent defense attorneys out there. And then for every one excellent one, at least I'm speaking on West Virginia terms, I don't want to offend any of you there, but for every excellent West Virginia uh, defense attorney, there's probably 50 awful ones that are not doing their clients any justice. And part of our role is to make sure that that doesn't happen to part of our role is to make sure that they are given a fair trial, that they, uh, you know, any defendant that comes in our doors are being treated fairly across the system. And that that's all of our business. It's not just the business of the defense attorney. It's not just the business of your officers and prosecutors of color. It takes all of us, it takes a village in that way. We need to accept that the numbers tell us a clear story. We may not like what the numbers say, but the numbers are what they are. Um, and it's important for us to really look at those numbers and, and, and to digest those numbers in our respective arms of law enforcement. What does this mean? How are, are we policing properly? Are we prosecuting properly? Um, are we sentencing properly? What are we doing? Let's take a good look at it. Because when we look at it as a snapshot of day-to-day -day work, it wasn't uncommon for me when I would handle misdemeanor cases to have anywhere from 40 to 50 cases a day. They'd run through quick as quick can be. When I was upstairs, I had more time when I would have felony trials. Um, but still, I'd look at each case individually. And sometimes we need to back up and we have to look at the cases both on an individual level. But we also have to look at them as a whole and say, how is my um, treatment of these cases coming across? Am I treating my defendants fairly? Am I taking the same crime done by two different people who may be of two different colors or two different genders or two different you know, eth you know, ethnic backgrounds, period? And am I treating them differently? And if I am, why? Because that's how our introspection can help us be more fair in the justice that we're doing. So I come back to that this is not just a police problem. Um, and anybody who is talking with me today will know that that is something that I stand by um, staunchly because 
This problem is larger than any one law enforcement officer. It hurts me as close as I am with so many law enforcement officers in the state of West Virginia. When I go up and I address every single academy class that comes through, I see all the cadets, I see all the basic officers, I see them several times, so many, so many times that sometimes I forget which classes I've seen and I haven't. And they're like, ma'am, we've already, we've already met you. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> but we're up there and I always share this with them too, because all of them are afraid. They're afraid to do something that will get them sued. They're afraid to do something that will cause them to be called racist. All of these, all of these, um, all of these labels that can be put on them, all of these things that come up against them. And all I can say to them is, listen, many of you will be sued, either for something you did or something somebody said you did. And you can't live your life running from those things in that way. You just have to do your job, follow your training, and do the best that you can absolutely do. Um, but for any of us that are prosecutors, for any of us that are judges, for any of us that are members of the public to point a finger at law enforcement specifically, at police as the problem for the issues that we have in our criminal justice system with regard to bias, it's unfair and it's not true. Um, I like to pull videos only because I feel like it makes a difference in seeing it. And see, you see it across the board. You see where these numbers have come from. You see where uh, these discussions are growing. Um, some years back, it was always law enforcement is the problem. Law enforcement is the problem. Well, law enforcement is not the problem. And we, as prosecutors in this, in this game, we, as judges in this game, have to do better at recognizing that it is not a them and us problem. It is an all of us problem, and all of us have a responsibility to fix it because the problem is real. Driving while black to the war on drugs, sentencing to parole, studies show racial bias is a factor in nearly every nook and cranny of the criminal justice system. That includes who's being arrested, who's being accused, and who's being uh, convicted of crimes. Here's Fred Stripshire. Let's start with the disproportionate risks of driving while black. In 2017, researchers at Stanford University studied four and a half million traffic stops by the 100 largest police departments in North Carolina. They found blacks were more likely to be searched than whites. That's even though white motorists were more likely than the others to turn up contraband. Let's move to the war on drugs. A 2020 report by the ACLU found even in the era of marijuana reform, black people are more than three and a half times more likely to be arrested for marijuana offenses than whites. Turning to the bail system, a 2011 study of bail in five large U.S. counties found that blacks received $7,000 higher bails than whites for violent crimes, $10,000 higher for crimes related to public order, and $13,000 higher for drug crimes. Let's move to prosecutors and plea bargaining. A 2014 study of Manhattan criminal cases found that black defendants were 19% more likely than whites to be offered plea deals that included jail or prison time. How about sentencing disparities? Well, a survey of data from the U.S. Sentencing Commission in 2017 found that when black men and white men commit the same crime, black men on average receive a sentence almost 20% longer. And finally, blacks are overrepresented in the parole and probation population. According to a 2018 study by Pew, one in 23 black adults in the U.S. is on parole or probation versus one in 81 white adults. So you can see how the numbers don't lie that it is not just a police problem. This is a problem that affects all of us. And this is a problem where our biases, whether we are cognizant of them or not, are playing a good and substantial role in what we are doing and in the actions we are taking and the pleas we are offering. So that's why I say we can't necessarily look at, why well, I did this case this way, I did this case that way. We need to look across the board at, am I handling all these things the same? If it's the same set of circumstances, in my case, if it's a DUI, and there was nothing aggravating. They were not uh, combative or abusive with the officer. They were compliant. Am I treating this driver the same as I'm treating the other one with regard to the plea that I'm offering? Now, if you come in my courtroom, you're always pleading guilty to a DUI or we're having a trial. Um, so trying to get me to plead to a reckless isn't going to happen. Don't care what color you are. However, we can talk about certain things. We can talk about your fine. We can talk about whether jail time has to happen or not. But the things that I look at, I try to make them. Um, issues that are not 
letting me be uh, biased by how someone looks, biased by um, their color of their skin, biased by their gender, but rather their actions. We're looking solely at their actions. From police to courts to prisons, African-Americans often interact with a justice system many say is stacked against them. What we've seen is, you know, if you are poor and black, you are not going to get, in most cases, a fair shot in this criminal justice system. From even from minor offenses all the way up to, to more serious offenses. Black Americans are more likely than whites to be stopped by police. Once stopped, they're more likely to be searched and arrested. Once arrested, they are more likely to be denied or simply not able to afford cash bail, and so they must wait in jail for weeks or months before a trial. Bail is not supposed to be punitive. This is one of the things that people don't understand. Um, you have not been convicted of a crime, so you are not supposed to, you know, uh, you know, be punished before you've been convicted. Many. So with that, again, it comes into show how we are doing our jobs. When we have our bond modifications and bail hearings, are we being reasonable with what we're asking? And, if we're, and, and by reasonable, I mean, are we, are we treating people across the board the same? If you are, that's fantastic. And help your colleagues to do the same. But all of us get wrapped up in these things. And the, the system includes all of us. We as prosecutors decide when charges are to be brought how and whether to prosecute these cases that can affect the life and liberty of our citizens, regardless of their color, and the level of charges and sentences to pursue. And this is a huge responsibility. This is part of the reason why prosecutors in all states are held to a different ethical responsibility than regular Joe lawyers. We are a special breed of lawyers. We are the, the section of lawyers that get to put people away for the entirety of their lives, and in some, some states, you know, take their lives. So it's important that we notice and recognize what our part in this fight is, and that we notice as a community. As I said to you before, I was the only Black prosecutor in our, in our county, in the largest county in the state. Statewide, and this is if you include me, <clears throat> at this point, I only do um, conflict cases. But if you include me as a prosecutor, of our 227 prosecutors in the state of West Virginia, we have three that are of color. Is that good enough? And by of color, I don't just mean black, I mean of color, Asian, Latin, of color. Um, and that's the, that, that's, that is what it is. That's the hiring. That's people who want to come and stay in West Virginia. There's a whole lot of factors that have nothing to do with race that, that go into that, but it also extends our responsibility, regardless of your color. If you are of the majority and a prosecutor, or if you are of the minority, and a prosecutor. We all have the same responsibility to make sure that we are doing our job in a way that does not allow any personal biases that we may have to infiltrate and to taint that. So what can we do? One, you can do your own personal work. I refuse to believe that any person that I see, talk to, interact with, pass by, roll my eyes at, whatever that may be, I refuse to believe that they don't have some form of bias somewhere. And it's our job as individuals to do that personal work and figure out, you know, are the decisions that I'm making tainted by any sort of personal biases that I may have? And if they are, does it matter? Because it doesn't always matter. But if it does matter, how can I fix that? And when we find that courage to disrupt bias, then we can, we can look at a lot of things very differently. Um, next, make connect connections with people that do not look like you. We all tend to live in silos. We're detached from one another, and COVID has not helped this situation at all. Um, but as public servants, we, prosecutors, we, law enforcement officers, we, judges, need to focus on building a circle of belonging in these communities that we serve. And we can do that by seeking out shared values. Just because I look different from you and my background is different from you does not mean we don't have things in common. We probably have quite a few things in common. And it's important for us to seek those things out. Um, just because you're different from me doesn't make you bad. Just because you're white and I'm not doesn't mean you're racist and it doesn't mean I'm not. But we have to, to think about what those things are and how can we do better? There is not, this is not to say that there are, uh, you know, that, that there's a, an entire people who are inherently good 
Um, but rather it's working on, from a premise that certain or all people are not inherently bad. And the way that we learn that is by making connections with others. Um, when you have privilege, use that privilege to, to create equity. So all of us have some form of privilege. My privilege um, lies in the fact that I'm fair complected, that I have some European features that make me, at least in the eyes of the black community, make me less black or make me someone who can pass and who can, who can um, you know, interact with the majority easier than maybe someone with more strong African features. Colorism is something that's very real and it's something that, that exists. So my privilege, which I don't have, I don't have white privilege, but I do have at least a perceived privilege because of how I look, that I am able to do more things or be, not be viewed negatively simply because I'm fair complected, simply because I have longer straight hair, you know, because this is what I look like. Um, so if you have it, use it to help others create equity. Um, Intentionally and deliberately engage in non-biased activities. Learn and share. This goes back with the make connections. Learn something new. If you need a book to read, brother or sister, I've got all sorts of them that are excellent. Excellent reads that help you both reflect on yourself and reflect on your communities. This is something that doesn't have to hold on to us and, and doom us forever. It's something that can be fixed. It's something that starts within and then goes without. So we can all do that and negotiate vulnerability. Some things are not comfortable. They're not gonna be comfortable. For example, there are some of you here that may be judging me or who may ridicule me for speaking on this topic because believe it or not, this is not a comfortable topic for anyone. As I started this presentation, I lost sleep over this presentation because it is such a sensitive one in our line of work. This topic is one that rubs everybody the wrong way for a host of different reasons. And it's not meant to convict you. With that said, if it does convict you, then that's, that's your starting place. That's where you figure out how do I make myself better so that this talk doesn't make me feel like you're calling me a racist. So that this talk makes me say, hmm, I have these things I need to work on that hopefully will make me a better person, make me a better law enforcement officer, make me a better and more efficient prosecutor, that's what I would hope would come from here. <clears throat> so how do we disrupt bias? There are a lot of ways. Um, quick response is a reason, there are certain triggers that cause bias. And these triggers are here outlined in this circle. Quick response, subjective standards, emotional states, threat, fatigue, cultural norms, lack of training, lack of accountability, lack of positive contact, lack of trust. And I think one of the largest ones is lack of empathy. We can disrupt by, um, bias by changing any of these triggers or eliminating any of these triggers. There was a, um, I'm trying to remember which, which agency it was, but with the quick response, it might've been, a, so I think it might've been an agency in, in um, California. But in order to, to disrupt that trigger of, of quick response for their law enforcement officers, they had a, a kind of stopgap where officers would have to say, you know, what sort of response is needed here? And it would make them stop and pause. So everything wasn't on, you know, having to be a, a minute by minute or second by second decision. Now, saying that and understanding what, what law enforcement officers do, I know that can be easier said than done. Um, but some of these are not. Fatigue, we can work with emotional states we can work with, um, stigmas around mental, you know, mental health and taking care of your own emotional and mental state need to be, that, that's a way to disrupt some of these things. And then the one that I think is most important is that lack of empathy. And that lack of empathy is something, again, if we go and we, we make a concerted effort to, to be uh, all encompassing of people around us and to understand that Nicole's walk may look different than Sarah's walk, may look different than Eric's walk, may look different than you know, Joanne's walk. All of us walk different lives and all, we don't, you don't have to love it. You don't have to accept my walk, but you have to accept that this is my walk and this is what I experience. And be empathetic to that and be understanding of that. And I will leave you guys with this. Now, a message from Arthur. I gotta call Buster. Hey, Arthur. Hey, Buster. 
Did you see that video? Yeah, I just watched it. It was awful. I can't believe someone would be hurt like that just because they're black. Racism is so unfair. No one should ever judge someone by the color of their skin. But how could it happen here in Elwood City, right outside the Sugar Bowl? Buster, it happens everywhere. I was talking to Mrs. McGrady the other day. She said there's a really long history of black people not being treated fairly in this country. It has to stop. We have to do something. Yeah. But what can we do? I mean, I'm eight. I can't even fry an egg on my own. I don't slacker. know. <gasps> Maybe Mrs. McGrady can give us some ideas. Hold on. Hello, boys. I'm so glad you reached out to me. Yes, I saw the video too. And let me tell you, it made my blood boil. Me too. It also made me scared. I mean, this happened in our neighborhood. It is scary, Buster. But you should know that a lot of grown-ups are fighting racism and working hard to keep us all safe. Why does this keep happening, Mrs. McGrady? Well, racism is like a disease. If you don't treat it, it's just gonna get worse. Wait, if racism is a disease, can I get it? Buster, don't worry. This isn't about you. Actually, it is. It's about all of us. It's not enough to just say, I'm not racist. It's not my problem. We have to actively fight against racism. As my friend John Lewis once said, if you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about it. So what can we do? Well, one of the most important things is what you're doing right now. Eating carrot sticks? <laughs> I mean, talking about it. Talk about racism with your friends, your parents, your teachers. Don't be afraid to ask questions. We all have a lot to learn about this issue. Also, listen. Listen to people who have experienced racism firsthand. Imagine what it would be like if it happened to you or someone you love. And finally, act. When you see or hear of someone being treated unfairly, stand up for them. Say something. It might be scary, but I guarantee you it's better for everyone, and it's the right thing to do. Wow! You've really inspired me! Yeah, thank you, Mrs. McGrady. I'm going to talk with my parents about this right now! Hey, Mom! Me too! Bye! Whoa! That's it? I was just getting going! Remember, kids, talk, listen, and act. If we work together, we can make a difference. And eat those carrots, too. <laughs>So with that, we've come to the end of my talk with you. And I hope that, even though I think that uh, that rabbit there is a bit of an underachiever because I know my daughter was frying an egg at eight slackers. But um, in all seriousness, this is a topic that I understand makes you, it makes me uncomfortable. But have these conversations, have them in your offices, have them with your officers, have them with your judges, have them with your families, because that's how we grow. And that's how we make things better. Um, it is our responsibility. We are the stewards of the criminal justice system right now. Our law enforcement officers are the, are the boots on the ground. We, as prosecutors and our judges, are all stewards of the system, and we have to make sure that we are not um, adding to the problems that are there. It needs to be fixed. It will take a larger fix than any of us can do individually, but what we can do is attack the own biases that we have, acknowledge that we have them, and try to fix them. And if there's something that's not, if it's a bias, it's biases that you have that is not affecting your work, fantastic, hang on to it if you want to. But if it's one that is causing you to administer justice in a way that is not fair, that is not um, just, then we need to help fix that. And that is a responsibility that is on the shoulders of all of us, not just our white counterparts, not just our black counterparts, all of us. So with that, I thank you all for your time. And I hope that there, there was something in this hour um, that you can take with you and that at least made you think. Um, and if not, you got to see a pretty cool Arthur video at the end. And if you need me ever, this is my contact information. Feel free to reach out anytime. Even just to say hi. Uh, thank you guys.
<clears throat> Nicole, this is Sarah. That was wonderful. Let me ask you a question real quick. <clears throat> I had a situation a while back and I reached out to you and I struggled with it because I didn't want it to be one of those pandering, oh, I'm going to call my black friend and see what she <laughs> thinks about this. Um, right. but, we did, but we did have a long conversation about it. What suggestion would you make to, to folks that are in the ma majority when they get accused of being a racist or they say something and they don't understand why that was offensive to the person um, to whom it was directed? Is it, is it wrong to approach your black friend and say, explain to me a different perspective? Is, is, that, is that pandering? Is that catering? I mean, explain. <laughs> what, what's the best way to do it? Oh, I don't know if there's the best way to do it. Um, I always start with the premise that it is not, it is not your, if you, if you have a black friend, it's not your black friend's responsibility to, 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 to teach you. However, if I am a good friend, which I hope I am. You are. But I, I personally have, I would prefer my friends that fall into or think that they've gone astray to call and talk about it. Because to me, the conversation is bigger than anything else. And if you're going to be con having a conversation with a group of people that you think are going to think exactly the same way as you, then that's not necessarily productive. So the fact that you reached out to me thinking maybe, maybe my, my perspective might be different. Um, or maybe I could help you understand the perspective of, you know, the situation that came up. I don't find problematic, but there is this dichotomy of you don't want to call your black friend. And I get that. Um, that's part of the reason I got stuck with my uh, black emergency, my bar president in the black emergency. And she, <laughs> exactly. she referred to me as her black friend I, countless times. And I had to say, right. why am I your black friend? Aren't we just friends? Right. Like, exactly. And you've never done that to me, but the conversation is what needs to be had. So you, though, I don't, I never saw any flaw with how you contacted me about it. You were upset about it. You're upset with something that made me have, I mean, like, like, like I could have more respect for you, it made me have more respect for you because I'm like, you care about the fact that you may have caused someone discomfort. And in the job that we do, it's important that we're careful about that because we see audiences of all shape, sizes, colors, and creeds. And we have to, we can't pander to everybody, but we have to do our best to make sure that we're not ostracizing or hurting anybody in what we say or do. So I think having the conversation with someone who you think may disagree with your position or with your thoughts, or may be able to give you some perspective is always a good thing. Okay. Because I mean, the only thing I can compare it to is when you're speaking to a victim family where they've, they've lost a family member to an impaired driver. And we say to them, we, I know how you feel. Well, you know what? I don't know how you feel. Right. right. But I want to try to understand so that I can be more sensitive in my own conduct. Exactly. And you will, you, you can't, I mean, I could never expect you to understand my walk um, any more than you could expect me to understand everything in yours. The best thing I think you can do is reach out and don't let that because if you'd have reached out and gone, Nicole, you're my black friend. I need you to be here. <laughs> that might have been a little bit different, but you reached out to me and, and said, this is the issue. And do you mind if I talk to you about it? And give, you know, give your person of color that you're talking to, give them the opportunity to say, I won't talk about it. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to have this conversation with you. But if they agree to learn from it, I mean, that, that's all that we can hope um, that everyone will do. The conversation is where it all starts. Yeah. In my opinion. <laughs> and I agree completely. All right, it doesn't look like we've got any questions, but we did have one person say that, thank you for a very informative hour. And I absolutely agree with that uh, completely. Hang on a minute. Um, oh, okay, let's see. Um, oh. We mentioned we ought to have these discussions about uh, racism and bias in our groups, but I'm unqualified to host a discussion. What, what resources are there for, for folks to get started? you know, as far as starting the conversation, what, what advice would you have? I mean, and again, you don't just look out and say, oh, good, a person of color, that's the one. <laughs> um, because your qualification is not just, a, you're a person of color and you've experienced things that I personally have not. But the fact that you've got such a, a, such a good perspective and overview of, of these situations. What's your advice? What's your advice? <laughs> Well, I will say I, I touched on colorism a little bit more, and I say this all the time when I am asked um, 
to speak. For example, I was I was a candidate for a, for a judgeship here in my county. And one of the questions that was asked of me is, why don't the Blacks run for office? And I'm like, ooh, the Blacks. The Blacks. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of graded on me. And then I'm like, I don't know that the black community necessarily wants me as their spokesperson. Like no one has designated me as such. My experience is different. There are a lot of people who will look at me and go, she's not black. She's this. And then there are a lot of people like she's definitely black. So even my perspective may not be um, the or is not. It, it's not may not. It is not the end all be all on issues of race relations and bias. Um, I just have one set of, you know, I just have my perspective that I can give you. Um, but as far as resources are concerned, there's all sorts of things. You have to kind of broaden, you have to broaden your view. I know we don't love the ACLU and we don't love some of these other outlets that are there, but they have some really good resources on um, statistics, on how, you know, what these things look like in the real world and how they're playing out in the communities that maybe you don't identify with. Um, like I said before, the, the ACLU's presentation on 100 years of policing, it touches Chicago, Los Angeles, um, it's five different cities, I believe they did. And all of them are really, really good at showing you how history repeats itself and how we get right back where we are again if we don't go to the root and fix it. Um, Southern Poverty Law Center is an awesome place to look uh, for resources. And then there's just personal, personal books. There's a book um, that it's funny. It's called Giving Up Whiteness. And uh, the author is a friend of a friend of mine. And as I was sitting reading the book, I just picked it off of Amazon and I was like, eh, need to read. We're going to do this one. Let's see what this one's about. Um, this book, the first, the first chapter is a text from Crystal and I'm reading it. And I'm like, oh, it's funny. And so then my friend Crystal and I are talking and she goes to talk about her friend who wrote this book. And then I'm like, wait a minute, you're the Crystal in the book? And she says, yes. So that's a book that, that kind of talks about it. Then there's another book, if you are interested in it, um, called White Fragility. And that book is written by a white person discussing racism in a way that kind of makes us look at it differently. One of the things that he said that I remember reading that book um, that kind of drew me into it is he was talking about what if we reframed how history is told? What if instead of saying that Jackie Robinson was the first black baseball player who was good enough to play in the major league, in the major league and white leagues, what if we said Jackie Robinson was the first um, black baseball player who was permitted to play? What if we told that story in a way that is actually more truthful? Because there were a host of athletes that were probably as good or better than the, the main league, the majority league, but they weren't permitted to play. So if we kind of, it kind of reshapes how we look at history and how we look at how history was taught to us. And that kind of gives you a better um, idea of how we even phrase things and how we um, tell stories to be able to say, am I doing this in a way that's, bi you know, that's being biased? Am I doing this in a way that, you know, telling the story or, or presenting this case in a way that is ignoring certain facts or rephrasing certain facts in a way that's not a fair representation? So there are a lot of outlets out there, and I'm happy to send a list over to you guys of things that I've used over the years and looked at, um, because I think knowledge is, I mean, this is so, it, it, it's stupid to say, but knowledge is power and, and getting in and actually understanding that history makes all the difference. It really does. Yeah. And I think maybe Nicole, the way to, to sum up your presentation is I think we are all so terrified that we're going to say something that causes offense that we don't say anything at all. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think if you, if you could start the conversation with the disclaimer, my purpose is not to offend. My purpose is to improve the way I am. Um, it softens anything that you might inadvertently say that riles somebody up. I, I would agree because I, I legitimately lost sleep over this presentation <laughs> because I did not want, is, I, no, you won't find somebody more, more uh, you know, law enforcement, pro-law enforcement than me, but every time this comes up, it's like, Oop, we're attacking, it's, it's a black girl attacking you know, police. I'm like, no, 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 that's not what we're talking about. This is a larger issue. It's not about just law enforcement. It's not about just prosecutors. It's all of us. It's an all of us issue. So I, I certainly appreciate, I appreciate you all letting me have this uh, platform to discuss this. And, and if you were offended as one of the listeners out here, know that you can charge it to my head and not my heart. It was not intentional, um, but I hope that it will help you all to open, open up your, your minds to some different avenues and ways that we can attack this problem. All right. Thank you, Nicole. Kate? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, let me add my thanks to you, Nicole, for the presentation and for your time, to Sarah for moderating for us, and for everyone who joined us today. Um, before you leave, feel free to use the Q&A window to share any suggestions to help us improve the webinar series, including any future topics that you'd like to learn about. Maybe spending a little bit more in time on implicit bias. Clearly, an hour is not long enough. Let's see. Um, the Following today's webinar, you're going to receive an email with the recording link, so please be sure to watch for this. The webinar or the email will also include a link uh, to request a webinar participation certificate. If you wish to receive a certificate, uh, be sure to use the link in the email. And for those watching this recording, please note that only attendees in the live webinar may request a certificate. We invite you to join us again for other traffic safety webinars planned for this series. Please visit our website at the link on your screen for a list of any upcoming webinars. And uh, at this website, you'll also find information about the next North Carolina Traffic Safety Conference and Expo. We hope you'll plan to attend the conference and we invite you to propose topics for presentation. You can follow the link for present <laughs> proposals on this website to submit your ideas. Thanks again for participating in today's webinar and uh, goodbye for now. Mm -hmm.